welcome to our limited series of audio panel discussions where we are sitting down with members of the Beacon team to unpack all things recession-proofing your marketing. I'm Jess Hadley and I'm Managing Director of Beacon Agency and I'll be hosting today's panel. In this episode, we're tackling email marketing in a recession and how you can continue to make the most of your campaigns. On today's panel, we have Rob Marriott, Marilise Loxton and Tanisha John. Rob, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Hello, I'm Rob Barrett. I am a senior account executive here at Beacon. I sit in the strategy team. Um, I have a specialization in email marketing. Hi, I'm Marilyn Loxton. I'm a copywriter here at Beacon. And today I'll be giving a bit of a content perspective uh, towards email marketing in a recession. Hi, I'm Tanisha Joll and I'm the creative project lead within the creative team. That includes a lot of undertaking of creative client work. And also I'll be here to give a creative insight on how you can make your email marketing campaigns stand out. Fantastic. Welcome to the panel, everyone. And let's get going. I'm going to start with the first question that we're all going to discuss, which is how do you as a client break through the noise of increased email marketing activity we're seeing at the moment and get more interactions with what you send? I think the most important thing to to do when you're trying to break through the noise is looking at what your competitors are doing. Um, sign up to loads of your competitors' email lists and start seeing what they're sending out to their customers. Once you have gathered a picture as to what they're doing, then look at what you're doing and how you can make yours different, how you can make yours stand out compared to theirs. Um, I think having having that as the big, big, unique selling point of your brand um, will make a big, big difference. I would, I would like to add to that, giving a little bit more of a, a content perspective. I would say an important thing to focus on is value. Um, your content needs to be 100% for your audience. Your audience needs to be the hero of your content. Um, and a good way to make this perspective shift is to ask yourself the question, what is the problem that my content is solving? And by essentially answering this question in your emails, that will make your audience click read and ultimately want to come back for more answers. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I think you can even take that one step further from a te technical aspect in terms of really understanding that audience that you have is also frequency that works for them. Um, it's, it's, you can have so much useful information or useful content, but it's also got to work in terms of how often they're receiving it and um, you know, uh, when they're able to watch it, what times of day work for them. So it's almost a big mapping journey. Would you both say, Robert and Marilise, that you've got to sort of kind of map out your different, you know, audiences, you know, days and how, how you can be adding value all the time? I would also add to that as well about utilising um, CTAs in your emails as well. You know, what what action do you want the customer to take when they, look, when they read your email? Do you want them to sign up to a landing page that... Do you want them to view your web store? So it's all about thinking what action you want your customers to take and then make, putting those steps in place to allow them to do that in your emails. Creative perspective, what can, we, what, could we, what can we be doing to ensure that emails are getting viewed? What, what would you suggest is, you know, from a creative perspective, how, how do we break through that noise and make sure our, that our emails are the ones that are being read and, and interacted with? And like Rob's saying, causing behavioral actions that we're hoping for rather than being being filed away in junk. Um, so running off the back of Marilisa's point, the first thing I'd like to suggest is keeping things uh, consistent and concise. So you've got less and less time these days to grab people's attention. So the last thing they want to be doing when they open your email is being a sat faced with a massive wall of text to siphon through and look for what the actual point is that they've come for. So keep your copy concise. Don't put more than they needs to be. Just get the real point across. And in terms of visuals, try to keep it visually consistent. If you want to build a community feel with your like with your audience, every time they open an email from you, it should be visually instant that that's who it's your company they've come to an email at. And then also, I would keep the make sure you use a lot of pictures. These are visually attention grabbing that go with your point. So even if they don't read it at all, they at least know exactly what they've come here to learn about or what product it's lead to. Don't hide from white space when you're designing these emails. 
um, if everything was tight, it feels a little more uncomfortable. So spread things out, include pictures throughout, try and build a structure where things are, for example, just a picture, a bit of copy, a CTA, and repeat that. Just something that flows nicely and breaks up the text with nice images to keep pushing your point through as you, as it's being read. I guess making sure it's digestible. I mean, we're all guilty of it as marketeers. You want to just put everything in the kitchen sink in there so that everybody can uh, kind of take everything on board in that one email. But ultimately, we can only like absorb so much from that that content. And actually, it's maybe being very, very sort of, uh, you know, editorial effectively going right down to what is the crux message I need to get? You know, one what's that's one thing I want them to take away from this, yeah. this email. And Marilise, from your perspective on the content side, you know, expanding upon what Tanisha is saying there, is there, in the tone of voice of emails, is there, you know, what do you recommend? Can can should things be more personal? Should they be more? I mean, I guess it depends on who who the brand is. Yeah. But is there is there things that we could be doing in our tone of voice that makes it much more of an engaging uh, piece of the, uh, content read? I think while it's definitely important to consider your tone of voice for your brand, because obviously if you are a brand that's typically more formal, more um, professional, it, it would feel really disjointed if you suddenly went into an email being really casual. So while that's really important to consider, you also need to consider your audience, like what's their age? Um, what is your product or your service that you are presenting them? Is it something that, um, let's say, big business people will be reading they would much rather probably prefer to read copy about this service which sounds professional which which gives that brand authority whereas if you are uh, advertising clothing to teenagers they might not resonate with that kind of professional kind of tone of voice you really need to think about who what is the identity of your brand and who is your target audience there's also about the, the 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 strategic message itself. Um, it's one of my favorite analogies, which is you don't meet somebody for a coffee and ask them to marry you on the first on um, the first day. <laughs> There's an element of uh, that you need to sort of take slow steps in building that trust with your audience. Um, is there anything you sort of recommend when it comes to the strategy of emails? Which is you know that all of us are des in wanting to make a sale at the end of the day for a product or a service. That's the ultimately for most businesses the ultimate goal. Um, but is there is there a strategic thing that they need to consider when like building out their email streams that enables getting customers to that point in a better way? Absolutely, what you said is is so correct. You know, we are all looking to to make a sale, um, but actually, sometimes customers will be put off by seeing emails that are just so intense and are so clearly trying to make a sale or push a product. Um, I think the main the main piece to take away would be that emails are a communication tool. They're not nobody buys from an email. An email is a good way of communicating your business and using that communication tool to help promote you, but not necessarily try and sell stuff. Absolutely. And and I guess we've come full circle to, you know, Marilise's original point, which is the content's got to be of value in and of itself and and, and uh, nobody likes being sold to. But it's, you know, the content is adding value, it's giving them further information, if it's giving them a great case study about how it's improved uh, and provided value, it, it, that's going to be much more resonant when it ends up in your inbox uh, than anything else. So why is it worth spending time planning out email nurturing tracks and, and sort of setting them up for the uh, year so that you've got these automated emails that, that can do certain things for you around your audience. The main reason why you would want to spend time planning out your, your email nurturing stream is purely from a point of view of time saving. And if you do it all in, in one go, you, you have it all set up ready to go. You don't have to worry about in a few months down the line, oh, we need to get this email created. We need to get this email sent out. The email's already built. It's already there. It will go out automatically. There's no need to worry about it. Um, I think the, the second reason as well, which a lot of people overlook, is when you're doing all of your emails at once, you can look at them from an overall point of view and you can see if the content is consistent and the messaging is consistent across all of the emails. When you're you know, leaving gaps between doing individual emails, it's very easy to lose sight of 
what the main messaging was at the beginning and your emails can end up looking disjointed and customers at the end of the day don't want to react with a, a business who they deem as um, not having consistent content. Absolutely. And and I guess it's a, you know, if you don't do it at all, it's, it's a very hard job to remember that you need to go and do those earlier pieces and you're basically treating your audience as all arriving and knowing you at the same time, you know, knowing that, you, you know, <laughs> that you've got a what pool of cust- customers or new uh, or audience members that came across your business exactly at the same time and therefore the messaging will then be consistent and they miss all that early beginning pieces because you've ha- gone on a journey with your audience. And Marilise, from a content perspective, what, what are the benefits that you can see in terms of doing that kind of setup for, for a bulk of your emails for the year? Uh, I was definitely going to mention the point about consistency as well, but just building on that and also Rob's first initial point about looking at an overview of the year, you can kind of see all the different seasonal events or like industry events that might be of relevance to your audience, any promotions that you might want to run throughout the year. And by doing this, by looking at them ahead of time, you can plan what is the content that I will be needing around this to make sure that when the time comes to put these nurturing tracks into action, your content will not only be ready to go, but it will be the best quality that it can be, uh, which is also really important regarding the whole consistency point. Absolutely. Um, and, And I guess as well, there's going to be certain outside of sort of events, there's going to be certain uh, always like FAQs with your business that people are going to want to know, like they want to follow and be able to pick their own journey in terms of the communication that they need from your business and following down different automated paths that you, you set up enables uh, cust- you know, audience members or clients or customers to really dictate that journey over the year without you having to really constantly build and, 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 yeah. and, and create that. And um, Tanisha, from a design perspective, what would you say is the benefit of sort of just taking some time to just uh, plan out some e- so email pathways uh, for, for your customers? Well, in terms of visual consistency, I think that there's nothing worse than getting to the end of the copy stage and realizing you actually needed quite a lot more time to plan out stuff like photo shoots or image gathering just to make sure everything looks consistent across each email. But having a killer plan, no matter how many of these tracks you want to set up, you're always going to be able to plan in advance a clear suite of assets that you're going to need for each path to make sure everything matches and no matter which journey you're going down, the visual journey is following that properly and someone doesn't feel like they get lost because suddenly, oh, the visuals changed halfway through what what happened here. You know, you're taking someone across a journey and you're not walking through like a forest, then a jungle and then a beach. like. You're keeping them in the same environment no matter which path they're going down. Absolutely. And, you know, sort of bringing it back to the main sort of theme of, of these uh, sort of audio panel specials that we're doing, there must be a, uh, I mean, we know that there is a uh, sort of economies of scale about doing a lot of this planning all up at once. And actually, in terms of, you know, if you've got a reduced budget and you're looking at how to get, make the most of it, I guess there is this ben- benefit of getting this sort of all planned out and doing it at once. Yeah, exactly. The time and money you save getting everything done in one go rather than having a photo shoot here, a photo shoot there, or spending a couple hours here and there in this gathering, looking over everything and realizing not everything matches going back and forth. It's just organization. It just saves so much time. Again, so Rob, would you say from your perspective, because obviously things change over the year we particularly if you look at the last sort of three or four years that we've gone through, things change quite rapidly <laughs> at the last minute. A lot of people would would argue, oh, okay, but if I'm planning everything out now, does that leave me vulnerable not to mean that I'm agile in the future? Or, I mean, maybe we're answering the answer for you, but it opens up that flexibility because you're not having to do the bread and butter emails day in, day out. I think that um, having your emails planned out, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you start them and plan them all out in January, that they are going to have to go out to later down the line. So if anything does crop up, you can always not send out those emails. It's all about thinking about how you can keep a consistent message throughout the year. So uh, with email nurture chats and email automation, and we're creating these email automations, we 
the benefit of, of actually doing that up front is, it's, I guess, it's freeing up your time so that you have the time to be agile and responsive to what's going on. But also, I guess, from a different perspective, if you're looking at the analytics side of it, by setting all that up early and looking at the reporting, you've got much more time across the year to, to refine what you're doing. So making even more uh, of the budget. Um, Marilise, from your perspective, when you're looking at improving the copy or the, you know, the subject line or the subject text, is it a, a very much a uh, try try and see how the results are and keep changing it is the best approach? You know, how would you tackle making sure that what, you know, what the, that copying content is like top notch straight away? I, I don't think there is really a quick, a quick fix because you won't know whether it's effective until you essentially trialed it with your audience. Yeah. But if you, I guess that is like in our previous point where we mentioned planning ahead, it does allow you to refine throughout the year without having to do everything from scratch. So throughout the year, if you, it's kind of like a type of A-B testing, I suppose. You take a little bit of time. You see, are people clicking? Are people reading? Um, if they are clicking, yes, that means your 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 initial call to action is working. But if they come to the next part of the automation and they're not clicking there, then you know, oh, okay, it's, it's the next step where the problem is. If they go first step, second step, third step then dropping off then that might be where your copy is the problem so it's all about looking at the different stages and then refining it that way because there's really no way where how you're going to know up front like oh this is going to be a solid win in the copy wise yeah absolutely and, and i guess the only way of seeing it is to see that email sent out multiple times across a number of you know like weeks or months just to sort of like get that information so you know what direction to go in otherwise it's yeah if it's ad hoc emails once in a while it's not going to have that same sort of yeah. consistency and moving on to question three it's, uh, it's a question i get a lot particularly at the moment everybody's trying to grow their audience uh, uh and grow 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 their sales when it's tricky at the moment a lot of uh a lot of customers out there are looking for value uh it's first and foremost as, as we go through through a recession so how do you grow your email list and, and and I'm going to add a little bit on that because you can grow your email list very high very quickly but it might not necessarily make from a very engaged audience so how do I grow my e an email list in a engaged way with uh, the people that sign up when you hear about people asking how can they grow their email list the first thing that will will jump to anyone's mind is paid social media advertising um Running a, a website conversions campaign on any of the main social platforms, see very high clicks through to landing pages um, and do drive signups. Um, but at the moment, budget is an issue for a lot of people. Um, so the budget available to run a, a paid social campaign might not be there. Um, but there are a lot of other ways you can grow your email list that a lot of people don't so much consider when they think about it and it's little stuff like hosting a form on your website that anyone who visits your website can see that on your contact page and you can gather that data um another way that that i've seen businesses do before as well is adding a banner in their company email signatures allowing people to sign up to to a landing page um and yeah they will be added to an email list so there's so many other little ways we can grow our email list without having to look at big budgets for advertising campaigns for example absolutely and yeah. uh, marilise did you have uh, anything to add on from a content perspective is there things that you can be doing organically on social media that ends up in a sign up on on your email list i would say first and foremost you need to make it as easy and effortless to sign up um because i would say your audience your audience isn't going to go and look for your form. They're not going to go search for it and they're not going to jump through hoops in order to sign up if you ask their, their date of birth, their address. Simple name, surname, email. That's all you need for now. Um, and then also in terms of content-wise, uh, a great incentive to get people to sign up is to offer something of value. So this can be a downloadable ebook, a downloadable white paper, um, an infographic. We see HubSpot doing it really well. They always have these... 21 tips to xyz if you download their free pdfs their free guide all you have to do is to sign up and you get it for free forever and it's is 
a little bit of extra value that you gave your audience purely for that information so they can get more from you in the future by signing up to your newsletter. Absolutely. And I think it, it just carries on and proves that thing, you know, of value constantly that whatever content that you're putting out there, whether it's across email or on your social media, if you're making it consistent and they can see that that your business or brand is consistently adding value with the content they're putting out, then it makes it a much more worthwhile proposition to give you my email and give you yeah. a hallowed space in my uh, ever-growing inbox. Um, Tanisha, is there anything visually that businesses should consider when asking people to sign up uh, to an email list? Is there visually things that they could do? Is there any particular content, whether that be video or static, that's going to help convert more people uh, into signing up to email lists? Um, I would first and foremost say be decisive about your message and try not to hide it. Like you don't need, it just takes one very relevant and very clear graphic. It doesn't have to be like fireworks and anything crazy. Just make it very simple. What is the value here? Why is it relevant to that person? Why would they want to be a part of that community? And what problem are you going to solve for them as, as a result of it? And that's what I think most people are looking for in the email right now, um, especially when budgets are concerned. Am I getting a good value here? Am I going to learn something from this that's going to improve my quality of life? And that's pretty much the crux of it, I feel. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just to sum up again, before we go into our last question, um, what's interesting coming across from you guys Throwing in a sort of a, a, an additional sort of question there is, is do you think that there's a tendency when we're going into troubling economic time when people would budgets are reduced to like up our email content and put just loads and loads and loads out there? Um, would you say that that's actually probably counterproductive to trying to, to, to add value um, and actually that we make... That, that having that kind of editorial control and going, no, 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 I'm going to keep to consistently putting out good quality, but putting out less is, is better. Um, so I guess it's that age old thing. Do I put out more email content or do, because uh, everybody else is, I don't know if you've all noticed your inbox is filling up or do you invest in the quality of it? I think having the, the most important thing is to have emails of high quality. Um, it's better to send high quality emails less frequently. If people are seeing their inboxes flooded with emails by the same company, they will just naturally get annoyed and unsubscribe. And then you've lost, you've lost the ability to contact them. You've lost a potential customer. Um, so I would say definitely keep, keep it at a minimum, but produce high, a high amount of quality. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, especially if you consider the whole email automation process there's a reason you sometimes leave two or three days in between sending them the next automated email there's a reason for giving them that breathing space so that you're not all up in their face the whole time and i think that that really uh counts for this situation as well yeah and just to add to that as well it's it's important to remember if you're especially if you're 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 sending to consumers and not necessarily if you're business to consumer as opposed to business to business a lot of consumers don't check their, their personal emails every single day. If you're sending them an email every day in a week, they they might not look at that. They might look at their emails once a week and they'll open up and they'll just see loads of emails from you and they're not going to know what's happening with the content. They're just, they might look at the most recent content and haven't seen the that content before, which provides some context or clarity. Yeah, it can be very intense. I mean, even if you're, you know, checking your emails every day and you're doing b2b the last thing you need is that your inbox perpetually filling up with yeah <laughs> with like, stuff that you can't actually get to and read and again we're coming right back to the beginning thing about making it valuable making it fit for the customer and you know or, you know your audience member understanding what they're going through in a day and when they've got time to read it and how much time they've got to, to read it and, and making that consistency work and that effort even when you've got less budget and you're a bit more say it's worth putting that that kind of strategic effort in at the beginning, defining all that, setting up a plan all at once, and understanding that, yep, this is all going to be consistent, and then spending the rest of your time tweaking over the year. 
um, and adding in things that are relevant than it is to sort of be like, okay, I'll send one out this week and I'll send out something this week and I'll send out something a day later just on impulse, I guess. Right, we're going to just go into our last question. So our final question um, that I want to put to you guys is, what would be the one change you'd recommend people to do to their email marketing plans for 2023? Um, I would think, I would say the main, the main change I would recommend is to people is to become intentional about your content. You know, look at what you're doing now, look at what you're sending, look at the level of your content. And then look at where you want to be and where you need to be. Um, and then what you need to do is plan to make content that fits where you want to be. Yeah, I would say, um, so mine's not necessarily purely from a content spe perspective now, but I, I think in terms of change, I would like people to shift their focus from growing their mailing lists to nurturing the ones that they already have. Because we are in a recession and consumers are spending less, uh, they're being more selective about who they spend with. So instead of going out there and focusing more on getting your brand in front of a whole bunch of brand new people, your your emails already go directly into your subscribers' inboxes. They've already made a connection with your brand because they signed up to your mailing list. So if you can focus less attention on growing and more on nurturing, then you can hone your content make it as valuable as possible to essentially uh, attract, retain, and convert the audience that you already have. I mean, brilliant, yeah. I guess, because you don't want to dilute your message and then, like we say, get that wide yeah. perspective that, you know, means nothing to, to nobody rather than hone in where it's it's more impactful. Uh, Tanisha, uh, how about you? Yeah, exactly. Just picking back off of that, I would say the most important thing right now is in a time where everyone's going to be focused on sales and how many more sales they can make, what people as consumers, I think, are really going to want this year is to feel looked after. And so forgetting about the sales approach, focus on personality of your consumers, focus on who they are and what they need, and put that into your emails, like remove the stock images, make things more personalized to them and you'll get a lot more attention that way. All the email marketing campaigns I've received in the past couple of months, the ones I haven't unsubscribed for are the ones that didn't make me feel forced to buy anything. Um, they're also the ones that, with their copy, took the work out of my hands of doing research into my problem and scaling through their content just to figure out what the real answer is to my problem, and it's just there for me in a nice package. Um, yeah, so I say that yeah totally agree with you i mean for, i mean i could take that and apply it to marketing strategy in general when it comes to a recession we want to be providing value building trust and making sure our audiences feel really really looked after um so that they feel comfortable and safe uh with our brand and anything that we're trying to offer them and i think if you can trust in that and i know it's difficult because everybody gets a bit nervous but if you can trust in that the sales are, a by, are the are the byproduct from it. You know, they will happen. You will get those happening because you focused on the key area, which it, which is important to everybody. Well, thank you so much for being part of today's panel. Uh, it was really fascinating, deep, uh, quick, deep dive into uh, email marketing. Um, and uh, thank you for being a part of it. <laughs>